Thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you all for, for having me. And uh, what a beautiful reading that was. It's one of the most powerful passages, I think, in our scriptures. Uh, and um, it almost doesn't need a sermon afterwards. Uh, I do want to just explain, uh, in our tradition, um, we, we have a saying that, um, anyone know what it means when the rabbi or the pastor takes, takes their watch off and puts it over here? Do you, what, what does it mean here? Oh, for us, it really means nothing. <laughs> so uh, thank you um, also to, uh, to Jeff, Reverend Rock. I want to use the formal titles, very important. Uh, I, I'm glad I could help you out on your first day here. <laughs> I am... Um, I've enjoyed photography for many years, uh, taking pictures, sometimes a, in the past a little bit professionally, but mostly just for myself and uh, on trips and nature, et cetera. And, and I took my cam one of my old cameras, um, not too old, I got it maybe five, 10 years ago. Um, I, I took it out of the drawer on Friday morning and it was really like the first time in, I think since December that I had taken it out because I, I saw that there were uh, the leaves were starting to change, and I love this time of year. My favorite times of year in Vancouver for taking pictures, and maybe just my favorite times of year for being outside, or when the flowers start to come out in the spring, and when the leaves start to turn red in the fall. And we're, we're getting close to the fall, and, and really I, I started to see the leaves turn, so I took it out. But it was a bittersweet moment for me taking out the camera, because I think the last time I had my cameras out and used them, was this past December when my wife and I were in Maui. Uh, and literally, we were spent three days walking around the town of Lahaina, which, uh, to my utter sadness, and uh, for so many other people as well, uh, is, is almost completely, completely destroyed. So there's a lot of emotion thinking about that wonderful town. Uh, but I took out the camera. I found a battery that wasn't dead. I took a few pictures on Friday. And actually, the first few pictures I took were outside of a church on 41st, anyone know Oak Ridge United? Uh, they, I think a few years ago, I, I, I think they must have been there before, but they built a new building and it has condos up top and they, they created some of the people there, the pastor, Heather Joy, and her, uh, well, mainly her husband, uh, Stephen, created a cafe, Feast and Fallow, and I've, I've been going there regularly for several months since I discovered it. And as I parked and went outside, I took a few pictures of like the, the buildings and construction cranes, of course, because it's near Oak Ridge, and the, uh, the plants. And there was a sign that said, I don't know if it's just from their church or a United Church broad thing, hate has no home here. And so uh, with the foliage and the sign, and so I was reminded of the welcoming feeling that I get here and, and there, and that, as you said, that I got last week at St. Andrew's uh, Wesley. It was their Christ Jewish Christian Friendship Day. But having my camera with me gives, the give me, the gives me the opportunity to remind myself to open my eyes, not just with a phone camera that I can take out of my pocket and use any time, but, you know, one with a, a lens, and you look through it and everything and, and find something to take a picture of. I get to open my eyes and notice things of beauty around me, things that get, make me gasp because they're so beautiful, or strange-looking, perhaps, or an odd-looking flower, an amazing flower, or red leaf. But the opportunity to see flowers and leaves, or even buildings or signs through new eyes or a camera lens is also a reminder that we constantly need to keep our eyes open to push ourselves to open to what's around us, the good, the not so good, the beautiful, and the things that spur us to take action. And then again, it also makes me think of Moses, or we say Moshe in Hebrew in the Jewish community when we're reading our texts, because he opened his eyes too, as we just heard about in that reading. I think it really is one of the most powerful pieces of text in our shared tradition, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. In the Jewish world, we call it the Tanakh. It's an acronym for the three sections in the, the order, slightly different order that we have uh, in the Hebrew scriptures in Judaism. And this text describing Moses encountering what we've called in English for centuries, the burning bush, 
I listened to the reading, and I listened again just now, and I think, what makes him really open up his eyes and notice it? Because I'm thinking about what, what this experience must have been like from Moses' point of view. Can, can, we, can we experience it maybe through his eyes? So take, let's take a little bit of a journey together and imagine what it was like for him. How would Moses describe this experience? It might be something like this. So here's what happened the other day. I was, I was watching over the sheep of my father-in-law. His, his name is Yitro. Well, that's, that's Hebrew, but I guess we could call him Jethro. That's English. That language doesn't come until much later in history. Or whatever the Midianite version of Yitro is. I married his daughter, and I don't even know the name of their dialect in Midianite. So anyway, there I was. I was shepherding, leading the sheep a bit into the wilderness, but not further than we usually go. Actually, I was at this mountain called Horeb. People call it the mountain of God for some reason. Actually, some people say Horeb is just another word for Sinai. So I was at Mount Sinai, and I I feel like that mountain is going to become even more important for me someday. Okay, well, anyway, I'm there with the sheep, and suddenly an angel appears from out of the bush. Yeah, an angel. It was an angel of God. Which God? Yeah, I know, we Egyptians have many gods, the sun god, the moon god, but this angel and this god seem sort of special somehow. But here's the really weird thing. The angel appeared in a blazing fire in the bush. The bush was burning with real flames. But that's not even the strangest thing. I mean, we're in the desert, it's hot, bushes sometimes catch fire, right? The strangest thing, that even though the bush was burning, it was not consumed. There were flames, but the bush didn't get burnt or smaller or shrivel up or anything. So at first I was just gonna keep walking because like I said, I I do see fires from time to time in the trees and bushes in the desert. We don't have much water around here, it's sort of normal, but a bush by itself, it would just burn out eventually and it would be fine. But then I thought to myself two things. I thought, I must turn aside to look at this marvelous sight. And of course, I recently rediscovered my Hebrew roots, even though I grew up in the Egyptian palace. So I thought in Hebrew, asura na ver'e et hamar'e hagadol hazeh. I will turn aside and I'll look at this great, big, amazing sight. But I also thought, Madua lo yiv'ar hasneh. Why does the bush not burn up? So I didn't get a direct answer. It seemed like maybe the angel would answer me, but then this this god, I said, you know, remember, not the sun god, not Ra, not one of the Egyptians god, this, this other god. And this god says, I'm the god of your father, not like Darth Vader, that was Luke's father, but my father, <laughs> my father is named Amram, and, I'm, and this God says I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac, God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Apparently those guys are my, my ancestors. But before I hear all these introductions, like I'm the God of your father and ancestors, etc., I get this real jolt because the first time I hear this God, what I hear from within the bush is Moses. And I say, here I am. Again, I'm, I'm speaking in Hebrew, so I say he nani, and this is, this is really a good one. My mom told me once, I think when I was really little, because you know my mom sort of raised me a little bit when I was a little baby and, and fed me. She said my great, 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 great grandfather, I think, Abraham, that's one of the people this God mentioned, said that, actually he said that word too. He said, he nanny, here I am. Apparently he was about to slaughter his own son Isaac and an angel calls out to him and says, Abraham, Abraham, and he says, here I am. So I thought I should say here I am also. And then this God says, don't come any closer, take off your sandals. And I was like, what? Take off, my, take off my sandals? Am I walking into someone's house and they don't want to get it dirty? God says, no, don't uh, take off your sandals because the place where you're standing is holy ground. And I say, fine, it's a little weird, but that's okay. And then he says that thing about being God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. And I realized I was looking at the bush and this God was sort of appearing in the bush 
And I just had to look away because I was, I was sort of afraid to look at, at God. Right? This seems to be a powerful God. So, so then this God says, I have marked well the plight of my people in Egypt. I have heeded their outcry because of their taskmasters. I'm mindful of their sufferings. And I've come down into this bush, I guess, to rescue them from the Egyptians and bring them out of that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the region of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Prizites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has reached me, God says, and I've seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, and you shall free my people, the Israelites, from Egypt. Well, there's a lot more to this conversation, like God wants me to say, let my people go to Pharaoh, to the king there, even though I'm not really good at public speaking. But the point here is that I feel like this whole thing wouldn't have happened if I hadn't just turned aside to look at this burning bush. And I think that really is the point that we can learn from Moses. And here we're learning from him before he even becomes the revered leader and teacher of the children of Israel. We learn that he turned aside to look. And we too need to turn aside to look in our own lives. When we see something remarkable or something that might be remarkable or even quite normal, we might find ourselves developing what Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, such an amazing religious thinker in the 20th century, he called this radical amazement when we open our eyes just a bit wider. In our Jewish tradition, the, the line of commentators on the Torah and the rest of the Bible. So the Torah is, is revered so highly within the Jewish community. The first five books of the, of the Old Testament, uh, we, we read it every, uh, every week on Saturday mornings and Monday mornings and Thursday mornings and Saturday afternoons. We study it throughout the week. And the commentaries, especially from the medieval period, uh, have become such a, such a major part of how we study uh, the, especially the Torah and the rest of the Bible. And a traditional way to study these texts, actually, is through a book that has, in Hebrew usually, but sometimes now translated to English, many of these commentators on the same page, like you might see on the, on the internet dis discussion, and they're even sort of arguing with each other, even if in reality they didn't actually live at the same time or even know each other. But the way they get placed on the page, you see commentators arguing with each other, having a discussion about a verse. So our most famous commentator in the Jewish textual tradition is named Rashi, Rabbi Shimon Yitzhaki, Shimon the son of, uh, or Shlomo Yitzhaki, the, Shlomo the son of, Shlomo is um, like Solomon, son of Yitzhak, lived in, in the uh, 1000s up to about a little past 1100. And he says that turn aside doesn't just mean to turn, but it means to go in a new direction. So when Moses, when Moses says asura mikan in Hebrew, in the Bible, but also in, in Rashi's commentary, it means I'm going to turn away from here. But that, that verb asura means like I, he's actually urging himself to turn away. It's the same type of verb as hava negila, let us, let us go rejoice. So Moses is saying to, he's urging himself on to turn away. And then he says, going to urge myself on to turn away, lehit karev sham, and to get closer to there. I'm going to get close to that, that special thing over there. He's opened his eyes and he saw that being, that, that bush that's not being consumed, even though there are flames coming out of it, and he's going to turn aside and get close to it. Another commentator who really loves to get into the grammar most of the time in his comments is named Ibn Ezra. Abraham um, ben Ezra, or Abraham ben, I looked it up, uh, ben Avra, uh, I looked it up yesterday. He's from the 11th, late 11th century in Tudela in northern Spain. You can hear Ibn sort of uh, sounds like the, the way that, uh, that Arabic would, would use the, the patronymic. And he actually, he actually introduced the decimal system using Hebrew uh, letters to Jews living in the Christian world. He says, 
that perhaps this means that when God saw that Moses had turned aside, he commanded the divine being, the angel, to call to Moses. And actually, when we heard the reading, I noticed that when God finally decides to speak to Moses, it's when God notices that Moses has turned aside. But here the comment is even that God told the angel to speak to Moses when Moses takes the time to turn aside. And it's an amazing comment. The suggestion that it was only because he turned aside that God tells the angel to reach out to Moses, that's really something. It means that if he hadn't turned aside and taken the time to actually think about what's going on there in that bush, religious history our history as Jews and Christians would be a whole lot different. In the, uh, in the Globe and Mail yesterday, I like to get the, um, I get the Saturday paper uh, delivered like the actual paper or person puts it in front of my door Saturday mornings. I don't get to read Saturday morning before synagogue very much. I, I look at the front page a tiny bit and then really it's when I come back from synagogue at 1 or 2 p.m. after our, our fellowship, our lunch. Uh, that I, I read it a lot, and my kids say, why are you reading that paper all the time? Marcus G., who's a columnist, I see his, his pieces often, he called a piece a walk, a walk through Vancouver's two, two worlds. And I have to tell you that I was completely unsurprised when I started reading the article because I almost knew right away from the title that he was going to be talking about the downtown east side and maybe just some other neighborhood right next to us. He was talking about Gastown in the downtown east side. And he starts his walk, and, and I imagine this is printed in the national paper. So um, any part of his article, pretty much read by someone in Vancouver, we're, we're familiar with what he's writing about. But really important that, that people throughout Canada hear what, what goes on in uh, just a few kilometers north of us. He describes walking through Gastown, walking into expensive stores with like a little, little jar of some uh, perfume or some, some essential oil for $100, bars, restaurants, tourists, really lively, nice, clean area. And then he kept on walking right into the downtown east side. And he describes for the reader what is really the epicenter of one of the worst opioid epidemics in North America and maybe the world. One of my first encounters with interfaith activities in Vancouver since I when I moved here in 2016 was going to a, uh, a vigil for victims of the opioid epidemic uh, and it was held at Christ Church Cathedral downtown and I met many people from the um, uh, from different uh, Christian denominations, and uh, um, I was representing the Jewish community, and there were people from other religions, and that was, and that was seven year, almost seven years ago. Marcus G. of the Global Mail is a journalist, and I don't think he's a photographer, so he wasn't taking his, cam his camera out and shooting pictures of Gastown or of people suffering from addiction and homelessness and food insecurity, but he saw it and he described it in a long article and describe the huge gap between one block and another in a city that we know so well. And all he had to do, just like Moses, was open his eyes and spend a few moments observing and turn aside. Not turn aside away from the pain and difficulties, as we so often do, and I do this too, it's, it's so easy to do that, but to turn aside and see. So what if we make Moses our role model, not as a teacher or leader, of the children of Israel through the desert. Of course, he's a remote role model for, for those things. We, in the Jewish world, we call him Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe our teacher. But our role model also in turning aside, in moving toward amazing things and difficult things and beautiful flowers and red fall leaves. Let's use this a, as an opportunity to open our eyes to each other, to Jews, to Christians, we Jews and Christians have had quite a history together. And here we are, sharing texts and music and prayer. Maybe food later? Maybe food? Okay. <laughs> Kathy says yes. As we go into this new week, after a nice long weekend, 
Let's try to open our eyes to each other, to sadness, to beauty, and to the burning bush. Thank you all so much for having me.